Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. How's it going? I'm just kidding with you guys. Um, <laughs> welcome to youth group. I'm so sorry for that. Uh, but it is good to just be able to do this. And I know normally I'd be saying it's good to see you all this evening. Uh, but really, I'm just thankful that we're able to still do youth group together. Uh, and I think it's encouraging to me, and hopefully it is to you, uh, that we're able to do this all at the same time. That even though I can't see you, and even though we can't sit next to each other, uh, listening to sermons together, even singing together, uh, I think I'm really comforted knowing that you're all here watching and listening and singing together, and that we're able to meet later together too. Uh, and so I really hope this is something that all of us can look forward to together, especially as our weeks kind of start to become kind of the same after a little bit. Um, this is now our time where we're going to start singing some songs together. Um, we're going to have a time of musical worship. And maybe just as a quick encouragement to all of you, I know that this whole transition to online is still kind of fresh for a lot of us, um, whether that's the Sunday services uh, on Sunday mornings or even just now for Friday evenings, uh, now that we're doing youth group. Um, it's still maybe an adjustment. And I know that could be hard, especially um, if it's hard to sing even just on Friday nights sometimes, it might be even that much more intimidating sometimes to sing at home with your families, uh, with your siblings. Um, and, and I understand, and I know that can be kind of hard. Uh, and whether or not you're singing out loud, very loud, or even just kind of quietly to yourself, uh, maybe just as a big encouragement to all of you is to really reflect on the lyrics of the songs that we're singing. Um, one of the things I think we're really trying to be intentional with this time is selecting songs I think that really kind of usher us into this time of worship of coming before God's word and really help us reflect on even just this past week on how things are going together. And so I really hope that this time of worship could be helpful for all of us to reflect on how God is actually a great God, even through this time of uncertainty. And that through this time of uncertainty, even though there's so many other things in this life that fail us and are failing us, that we know that we can take assurance in Christ. And even when we don't fully understand that, that we can always remind ourselves that he has been faithful to us and that we can trust in him because of that. So let's start our time together uh, by praying and then we'll jump into uh, some singing together. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for just this time of being able to worship you. Um, and God, I know that uh, it can be hard, um, especially doing this online and it can be easy for us to get into the routine of doing this as well. But God, I pray that we would always be reflecting on how good of a God you are, God, and how desperate in need we are as sinners. And I pray that our worship now, God, would be a response to our need for you, our response to how good you are and how much we love and are thankful for you. Um, God, I pray that you would help us in this worship now. Um, and God, I pray that we would be encouraged to know that even though we may be seeing in our rooms by ourselves, with our families, or wherever we may be, God, that we can be encouraged that that we are actually singing together, that we are worshiping together, God. And it is so good of an encouragement to know that we have other brothers and sisters to rely on and to be encouraged by. So God, help us to be encouraged in this time of worship now. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Who has felt the nails 
falls upon his hands. Who has felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man? God eternal, humble to the grave. Jesus saved.
cross Big up cross that made the rise and clouds behind and that's a cure and the palm will be the better for the storms that we Father, I, I pray that you would help us now as we come before your word, help us to be attentive, God, to be uh, just eager to learn more about you, God, to, to try to know you better, especially through a time of so much uncertainty. God, I, I pray that as we have just sung, um, that we would be able to say that Christ is our sure and steady anchor, that we would be able to point to times that you have been so um, just good to us, God, when we haven't deserved that and maybe didn't even expect that. Uh, and I pray that, God, our time of coming for your word would just be helping us to see a little bit more clearly, God, who uh, Christ is and how we can trust in him more. Uh, so God, help, in this, help us in this again because we need your help. And I pray that we would just be able to, um, yeah, just to continue worshiping you as we come before your word and later in small groups. God, thank you and praise your son's name. Amen. Happy Friday, y'all. Uh, before we get started with the sermon, I just have a couple reminders. In the description below, you'll actually see that there's a link to the sermon notes like we usually have. Um, if you haven't already, I do recommend you either print them or you write down the outline, outline so you can follow along. The second reminder is that even though we're obviously not at the church building together, try to treat this like the real thing. Um, so get off your bed, uh, go to a place without distraction, put away your phone, Maybe take the laptop off your lap so you're not just uh, tempted to type on it. Uh, get your Bible, get some water, get a notebook and a pen, um, etc. Basically, do whatever you got to do to help yourself pay attention because listening to digital sermon is hard. Also, you can actually pause this video even though it's live, so you, you can give yourself a few minutes to do that. Uh, just don't take too long or else you'll be late, late for a small group. We're going to go through Esther 2, 1 to 18 today. But I actually want us to start reading Psalm 135 and then read Esther 2 throughout the sermon. Psalm 135 says this, Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is lovely. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all the deeps. Please pray with me. Father, you are God and there's no one like you. You're great above all gods and you do whatever you please. In the heavens and the earth and the seas, even to the depths of the sea, you alone are king. So teach us, Lord, to trust you, for we need our eyes open to see you. We need our ears dug out to hear you. Our hearts survive to love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In every play, there is our characters, a set, and a plot. Now, of course, for a good play, you probably want a good orchestra, good dialogue, uh, great costumes, and good songs. But whatever you add, every play must have at least three, three things. Characters, set, and plot. So think about the book of Esther as a real-life play. First, who are the characters? So far, we've met the main character, um, Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus? Xerxes? The king. Uh, he's the king of 127 provinces from India all the way to Ethiopia. Second, a, a little harder question. What's the set? That's right. It's the Persian Empire, uh, 483 BC, in the capital of Susa, approximately 100 years after Nebuchadnezzar took the Jews into exile. Good memory. Third, what's the plot? In chapter one, the king threw a fancy party for his fancy friends. And at this party, he commands his wife to be the entertainment, the eye candy, but she refuses. So he gets all mad and the suggestion of his princes makes a law prohibiting her from ever coming back into his presence. And he fires her from being queen, which when you think about it, he's got a pretty big anger problem. That brings us all the way to chapter two. But before we get there, have you noticed something's missing or rather, someone. We're not reading Harry Potter, right? We're reading Esther, a book in the Bible. So where is God? This week, I have a, actually have a challenge for you. Read the whole book of Esther 
It's just 10 chapters. And as you read it, ask yourself, where is God? We don't see God with our physical eyes. We don't hear God with our physical ears. That, that's sort of obvious to Christians, right? But have you ever been asked, how am I supposed to trust a God I can't see? How am I supposed to obey a God I can't hear? Or how am I supposed to believe a God when he doesn't do anything? When times are toughest, he's farthest. When I really needed him, he didn't answer my prayers. I have friends who've asked me those questions. I've asked those questions in the hardest of times. And I dare say you've asked those questions too. In light of that, our key idea today is this. Faith is trusting the unseen God, the author of history. Scene one, the fool. History tells us that after chapter one, King Ahasuerus went off to fight an epic war against the Greeks, including King Leonidas and Sparta, which you may have learned about in history class. Well, Ahasuerus, king of 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia, lost the war. So he, come back, he comes back to Susa dejected. Read verse one with me. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed by him against her. This is called regret. He just lost the war and he doesn't have a wife to come home to. Poor Ahasuerus, king of Persia. You can just hear the sad violin music in the background, but don't feel too bad for him. To cheer him up, verse two, then the king's young men who attended him said, that beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the woman. Let their cosmetics be given them and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. So let's be really clear. This is a disgusting plan. The king's friends are proposing to take hundreds of young women from around the kingdom and force them into a beauty contest for the pleasure of one selfish, wicked king. It's an empire-wide Queen of Persia contest. Now, what do you expect the king thought of this plan? Let's read the end of the verse. This pleased the king, and he did so. Now, what kind of man is the king? The Bible would classify him as a fool. I really like how the NIV translates Proverbs 23, 10, 23. A fool finds pleasure in wicked schemes, but a person of understanding delights in wisdom. Pleasure in wicked schemes? Check. Throughout the book of Esther, you'll also find this king doesn't really have a mind of his own. He's always asking other people what he should do. And this doesn't really work out for him in the first few chapters because he's always surrounding himself with friends who give really, really bad advice. If you have friends like this, who are always suggesting that you do dumb, sinful things for fun, I really only have one thing to say to you. Stop listening to them. Tell them about Jesus. <laughs> but back to our story. Right? So the king leaves the stage, the lights go down, the stage hands move all the props, the orchestra changes score, and then the spotlight lands on a man. Scene two, the nobodies. Verse five. Now there's a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shemi, son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. Verse five gives us this man's heritage, name, and family history, all of which are always super important. First, he's a Jew, meaning he's part of the chosen people of God. But then we learn his name, Mordecai, which actually comes from the name Marduk, which is a Babylonian god. That's weird. Then we're given Mordecai's family history. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, and his ancestors about 100 years earlier had been exiled from Jerusalem. Mordecai's identity was defined by exile. His ancestors were invaded. They were kidnapped and then dragged away, never again to see their homes, the temple of God, or the land that was blessed. They became nobodies in a foreign land. They had no power, no hope, and it seemed no God. They were exiles. And now, enter stage left, a young woman. Verse seven, read it with me. He, Mordecai, was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, 
for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So Mordecai's little cousin, his adopted daughter, is named Hadassah, which probably comes from the Greek word, or excuse me, from the Hebrew word for myrtle, a type of plant with berries and pretty white flowers. It's kind of like the English name violet or rose or olive. It's beautiful. But she has a second name, a Persian name, Esther, which scholars think is either derived from the Persian word for star or from the pagan goddess name Ishtar. Esther, Ishtar, pretty close, right? And she is the Mesopotamian god of love and war. So both Mordecai and Esther have names derived from false gods, but they're Jews who are supposed to worship Yahweh, the God of the Jews, the one and true living God. It's a strange contradiction. So now let's compare this scene. Chapter one, fancy palace, fancy party. And this scene kind of meaningless at first, right? Mordecai and Esther are nobodies. They're Jews, they're exiles. But wait, go back to verse seven with me. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. Now go to verse two. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. Uh Uh-oh. We know where this is going. Scene three, not the story we would write. Look at verse eight with me. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the woman. So the nightmare comes true. Esther's treasured beauty becomes her greatest curse. If you're a girl, imagine yourself in Esther's sandals. You're about 15 or 16 years old, minding your own business, maybe looking forward to marrying that nice Jewish boy who you've been noticing. And then one fateful day, you're taken from your home into the royal palace, destined to be part of a twisted beauty contest for the pleasure of one wicked king, who's probably old enough to be your dad. How would you feel? What would you do? If you're a boy, imagine yourself in Mordecai's sandals. You've dedicated your life to raising your little Hadassah. You've taken her in, sheltered her with care, and loved her as your own daughter. And then one fateful day, she's taken into the harem of a wicked king to be objectified and abused. How'd you feel? What would you do? Now, if I were Mordecai, that king better watch out. Uh, my younger sister is a senior in high school. I took care of her when she was a baby. Um, I actually led her to Christ. And I, had the joy of, I have the joy of watching her grow up to be a young woman. She jokingly calls me uh, her second dad. I'm not really sure why. Um, if any of you were to come, sorry, if anyone was to come, and try to take her away to hurt her. I don't care who he is, whether he's the king of the world or not. I would destroy him uh, in the most Christian way possible. Um, at the very least, I would die trying, right? Now, I'm no father, but as every good father knows, and uh, you must have a jealous love for his father. For his, <laughs> okay, wow. At the very least, I would die for her. I'm no father, but every good father has a jealous love for his daughters. Right, David? Yeah, he's nodding to me. But that's not what we see in the book of Esther. Look at verse 9 with me. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. The young woman is Esther. Him is the head of the harem, Haggai. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with the seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young woman to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Esther doesn't resist. Mordecai doesn't save her. Now a Jew reading this would be shocked. They would have expected Esther to choose death rather than her position. They would have expected Mordecai to fight rather than give his daughter to this king. But verse 9 says that Esther pleased the guy in charge and got the best makeup, the best food, the best servants, and the best place in the harem. The text doesn't say, but it kind of seems like she wants to win the Queen of Persia contest. The best food is certainly not kosher. In verse 10, she even hides her identity as a Jew, 
as if she's ashamed that she belongs to the one and true living God. That's unacceptable for a Jew. In fact, it was so unacceptable that later Greek translators of Esther try to change the story to make her a better person than she really was. I know a lot of Christian parents named their daughters Esther because of the story. And if your name is Esther, that's wonderful. God bless you for having such a beautiful name. But the Esther of Scripture isn't exactly what you would call a godly Christian role model, especially not in chapter 2. She compromises in every way possible for a Jewish girl. She's like a church-going high schooler who dresses scandalously to attract boys, who dates unbelievers and parties hard. It's compromise, bending to the pressure of the world, not courageous conviction that stands. Sadly, Mordecai isn't really any better. Uh, we do see in chapter 11 that he cares for Esther, which is good, right? But he's also the one that tells Esther to hide her identity. That's like you hiding the fact that you go to church or you sing songs to Jesus because you're afraid of getting made fun of at school. It's cowardly compromise. It's fearing men rather than God. It's not courageous conviction that stands. Now, my point is not to condemn Esther and Mordecai. My point is this. They're not the heroes we expect. They're complex. They're conflicted. There's both light and darkness in them. They're kind of like, I don't know, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Rahab, Samson, King David, the apostles James, John, Peter, and Paul. Remember King David? He's Goliath's bane. He's the shepherd king of Israel. He's the man after God's own heart. Yet he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He killed her husband to cover it up. And then he resisted admitting guilt until Nathan the prophet came and exposed him. Compromise is part of his story. Remember the apostle Peter? He followed the Lord Jesus Christ for three years. He saw all the miracles, heard all the teaching, and then in the moment of pressure, he denied that he knew Jesus Christ. Not once, not twice, but thrice. Compromise is part of his story. The characters of the Bible, except Jesus, are not perfectly righteous people. The best of them sinned. A lot of them compromised. And we're just like them. Our classmates curse and cheat, and so do we. Our friends send us pictures and videos we know we shouldn't be looking at, but we do. Our teammates complain about their teachers, and we say, oh yeah, well my teacher. Our friends waste all their lives on imaginary worlds with dragons and warriors, but we live for those fantasy worlds too. We know we're supposed to worship God, to love and obey him because he's loved us first, but what do we actually do? We sin, we lie, we blame shift, we idolate, we make idols, we compromise, like Mordecai and Esther. They're God's people in a foreign land, struggling, stumbling, sometimes failing, to live out what it means to be the people of God. It's strange. We find our own stories located in a story that takes place over 2,500 years ago in a place thousands of miles away. But we're not done yet. Scene four, the author of history. Now we see the details of this twisted beauty contest. Read verse 12 with me. Now when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus, after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women, it's basically a year-long beauty school, it's like totally over the top. Verse 13, when the young woman came when the young man went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go in, in the morning she would return to the second harem in custody of Shaskaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted her and she was summoned by name. Basically, one woman, one night, one chance. Same thing the next night, but a new woman. And this would be put on repeat for literally hundreds of nights, however long it took for the king to choose a wife. Most of the women he wouldn't even remember or care to remember, not even their name. But now the tension rises. Look at verse 15. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Here we get Esther's full name. 
Her biological father is Abihail and her adoptive father, Mordecai. In the fullness of her beauty, with determination and wisdom, she goes to the king. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tibeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Whew, we can let out our breath, right? Verse 18, let's finish the passage. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. And so through many twists and turns, this orphan Jewish girl, a nobody, an exile, Esther, becomes the queen of Persia. Cinderella ain't got nothing on her. But think with me, how did this actually all happen? First, the king foolishly despises Vashti for a trivial reason. After losing the war, he enacts the Queen of Persia contest to gather not only the high-class Persian women, as was customary, but from everywhere in the kingdom. The king's servants find Esther and Mordecai, who just happen to live in Persia and have not moved back to Jerusalem. Esther just happens to be unmarried and beautiful, so they take her to the palace. Esther and Mordecai compromise and allow Esther to be taken. Esther just happens to find favor in the harem, not only with the leaders, but with everyone. And finally, the king just happens to choose Esther. Out of hundreds of women, this one Jew becomes his queen. This can't be coincidence. It's almost like someone wrote it this way. At first, God seems to be absent from Esther, but he is there. There are no signs, no miracles, no prophets on earth, no voices from heaven, but his fingerprints are everywhere. There are no coincidences. God is the author of Esther's story. But today, God is still the author, the author of history. As has been punnily said many times before, God is the author of history because it is his story. As the author, he has authority over the characters, the sets, and the plot. We are characters in God's story. Some of you were born beautiful. Other of us are more plain. Some of us are really good at sports, school, games. Others, not so much. But true godliness is contentment. Not comparing ourselves to other people, not trying to live up to some impossible standard. You don't have to be the prettiest, the coolest, the strongest to be loved. God loves you right now, in Jesus Christ, as you are. We are on the set of God's story. Before we were born, God didn't ask us what kind of family we wanted. He alone determined our parents, our siblings, our ancestry, our backgrounds, our birthplace. And we have to give thanks to God for that. Even for the hard things, like broken homes and disabilities and frustrating siblings. We are within God's story. Pandemics, disease, disaster don't surprise God. Our suffering is not accidental. Even our sin doesn't mess up God's story. I want to say that again. Even our sin does not mess up God's story. When we disobey our parents, when we fear men's opinions, when we bow to peer pressure, when we compromise, God is not fretting in heaven saying, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? Right? He knows. In life, some of you will feel like you've really blown it. Maybe you feel like that right now. Like you've taken a Sharpie and blacked out your future. Like you've trashed and soiled the canvas of your life. The one and true living God is the God who loves sinners. Jesus Christ came to save the wretched and the weak and the sick. Your sin does not surprise him. It is part of the story. Now, that doesn't make your sin any less sinful. It doesn't make it any less painful. And it doesn't make you any less guilty. But it does mean that there's hope. Because Jesus Christ died for sinners, for compromising people like you and me. We can find hope in him. So come to Christ. There is fullness of love in him. God wrote our story, every moment of it. And because he is good, perfectly, wonderfully, wholly good, and does good, we can trust him, the author of history. You see, we're not just preaching Esther because of the virus. 
We're preaching it because we need to know how to trust the unseen God in every aspect of our life. It's easy to think we trust God when life is good. But will you trust God when times are tough? When your siblings drive you crazy, when you're bored out of your school, when you don't win the championship, when your fears unfold, when your graduation's canceled, when you lose your best friend, when your parents get divorced, when your mom's killed in an accident, when sermons seem irrelevant, when church friends leave the faith, when you pray but don't get an answer, when your God seems far away, when you turn away from God to sin, when he disciplines you and you don't repent, when you have no hope, no joy, no peace, no life, when you're in the valley of the shadow of death. Beloved, will you trust him then? Corrie ten Boom was born in the Netherlands in 1892. In 1940, the Germans invaded and occupied her country. For almost two years, she and her family saved Jews and other refugees from the Gestapo, that's the Nazi secret police, as part of the Dutch underground, feeding, clothing, hiding, and helping them get to safety. But in February 1944, Corrie's family was betrayed, arrested, and sent to prison. Corrie was 51 years old and prison was terrible. Her elderly father died 10 days after arrest. Corey was kept in solitary confinement for three months. The prisons regularly forced her and her sister to strip naked to be inspected. Her younger, there was never enough medicine and their beds were full of fleas. Her younger sister, who helped Corey evangelize to the fellow women prisoners, died in prison less than a year later. And only 15 days after her sister died, Corey was released. Later, she found out that it was because of a clerical error and that a week after she got released, all the women in her age group were sent to the gas chambers to die. Corey spent the rest of her life ministering to the abandoned and war weary, testifying to the goodness of God in her sufferings, telling of the good news of Jesus Christ. She was such a godly woman that actually at one of her speaking events, she met one of the prison guards who made her life so miserable and she forgave him on the spot. Corey also liked to embroider. For those of us who are not as crafty, uh, embroidery is kind of like sewing to create a picture on one side of the cloth with colored thread. And as she would speak, she would often hold up this embroidery and say, look at this piece of embroidery. The wrong side is chaos. But look at the beautiful picture on the other side, the right side. She later wrote, although the threads of my life have often seemed knotted, I know by faith that on the other side of the embroidery, there is a crown. This side of life is a mess. It's knots, it's chaos, it's crazy. But when we trust God, we can say, God, you know, I don't. I don't know why. I don't know why this suffering or that trial, but you do. You promised to use all things for the good of those who love you. So God, show me Jesus Christ. Help me to love you. Show me that in him I'm dearly loved, that in him I belong to you, that in him alone there's hope and joy and peace and life. Help me to love you more than sin because you love me in Christ first. When we trust God, we can long for the beautiful side, the other side, the right side. When we trust God, we confess that he is the author of history and that he's the author of our story too. Father, when our lives are not what we desire, when we're tempted to doubt, we say, what are you doing, God? Forgive us, Lord. We see only the underside, the suffering, the sin, the pain. But you, Lord, are weaving a tapestry of beauty, writing a more glorious story than we could ever know. So help us to trust you, Lord, in every circumstance as the good author of our story. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We have just one announcement for the night. Uh, next Friday is Good Friday, where we get to celebrate the death of our Lord Jesus Christ in a, in a special way. Uh, Pastor Kim will be preaching for that service, so we will not be having youth group next week. So look forward to worshiping with the whole church visually uh, next Friday. Small groups will start at 8.50 tonight. So go to the bathroom, get a snack, uh, take a break, and join back for small groups at 8.50. Have a good week.